Welcome to Learn Japanese Pod with me, Alex, and me, Ami. And this is a special podcast because this is an Ask Us Anything podcast. This gives you an opportunity to send us an email and ask us your Japanese questions, and we shall endeavor <laughs> to answer them right here on the podcast. Well, I'll try, and we'll also enlist the help of Ami Sensei. Kyo yoroshiku onegai itashimasu. Onegai shimasu. So there are two ways you can send your questions in. It's either via email at info at learnjapanesepod.com and you can also fill in our question form at learnjapanesepod.com slash questions. That's learnjapanesepod.com slash questions. Let's just kick off. Let's just get to it. Okay. So the first one is from Tommy from Australia. All right, Tommy, how's it going? He's a very interesting, awesome guy. And、um, I actually know Tommy.、Uh, we actually met in, in Japan. He came over here with、uh, family and friends. Oh, okay. And a、uh, very important fact that everyone needs to know is that Tommy, is,、uh, Tommy does an extremely good Robert Smith impression in the karaoke booth. Anyway,、huh, okay. so, so big shout out to Tommy and hello to Alex. I hope you come over to Japan sometime soon. He asks. I was wondering what you would recommend as good listening material apart from Learn Japanese Pod. How could you listen to anything <laughs> else, people? Come on. What would you recommend as good listening for those learning Nihongo outside of Japan when immersion isn't always possible? Right. So, say you're, you're learning Japanese, you're not in a Japanese speaking environment, and you want to really increase the amount of listening you're doing. So, apart from watching anime, And formal lessons and your podcast, I'm having trouble finding ways to include listening into my day to day. I've considered listening to Japanese podcasts which are related to my interests, for example, guitars,、uh, but not necessarily focused on learning the language, though I'm not sure how much this would help. Any osasume would be greatly appreciated. Great. So,、um, Tommy san, all I can say is just get as much listening. With audio as you can. So, it, at this point, if you're a beginner, I would say NHK is one good resource you could use. There's this thing called NHK Easy Japanese Yasashi Nihongo. It gives you a series of basic lessons teaching you essential phrases for everyday life. It's well laid out, albeit a little stiff and not very exciting.、Mm-hmm. It, it's, not, it's not the most exciting anime or Manga, anything like that, but it's very professionally made. And another really good resource is News Web Easy. Don't ask me why they called it that, but it's called News Web Easy. Again, that's by NHK. Now, this is one of the best resources, in my humble opinion, for listening. It gives you the news in Japanese using very simple Japanese with furigana. Over the kanji, so you can read them with hiragana.、Mm. And it's a great way to learn about current events in Japan and learn Japanese. It's amazing for beginner students. And so just go crazy with that. It, it's really, really good. The other thing is, again, just get as much listening as you can using YouTube. Again, don't be scared to watch anime, movies, or TV shows. As a beginner, full immersion. That technique is really, really, really good if you're an intermediate or an advanced learner. If you're a beginner, it can feel a little overwhelming. But I would say, even if you're a beginner, definitely watch as much TV or YouTube as you can and don't worry that you can't understand anything. Now, again, if you're not, le- if you're not living in Japan, it's harder to do this, but you just have to get as much listening practice as you can. So just, just do the best you can with the tools you have. And one final hack that I would suggest to anyone is watch the Japanese weather forecast. Now, this might sound a bit strange, but it's short and it uses the same vocabulary over and over again、mm-hmm. with video that can really help you to understand what's going on so you can guess the meaning. So, check out Japanese weather forecasts. But just keep at it, Tommy. Nihongo, gambatte kudasai. Gambatte kudasai. Okay, so the next question is from Lee. And Lee says, 
I've started learning some words have different meanings but appear differently when read. How likely would it be for people to understand which meaning is being talked about in a typical native Japanese conversation? For example, kami, God, and kami, paper. Both are pronounced kami. Okay, so great question, Lee. And you are absolutely right. Um, when you write them out in furigana or hiragana, it is kami, or in romaji, k-a-m-i. But these two words are actually uh, pronounced a little differently. The intonation is a bit different. Now, the word for God is pronounced kami. And the word for paper is pronounced kami. So just emphasis on, you know, the beginning or at the end. Okay, so uh, God is kami and paper is kami. Okay, I don't want to get too technical, but let's say you were outside of the Kanto area, then, mm -hmm. um, or unless you were outside of the kan Kanto area, then you um, definitely do differentiate the intonation. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, I think that even if you got the pronunciation slightly wrong, then, you know, they'll still understand you because context, right, is always key. You know, they might like kind of smirk a little bit <laughs> if you get the intonation <laughs> right. wrong, but I think you'll be just fine. That's a great explanation, Ami Sensei. So, uh, God is, uh, please correct me, kami, is that right? Yes. And then paper is kami? Yes, correct. And then hair is what? <laughs> hair. Okay, let me see. Kami, same as paper. Kami o kiru. Yeah. So, kami o kiru. It's like cut your hair. Well, yeah, I guess could you could be cut paper cut too. The paper. <laughs> But okay, forget it. it. Take, we take that back. They're not going to understand anything. Oh, you could just kidding, point kidding. to your hair and be like, Kami yeah, get point it. to it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so don't worry too much about it. You know, actually, um, one thing I'd really like to do with you, Ami Sensei, with your help, is to do a whole podcast or maybe a series of podcasts on intonation. Mm -hmm. Sure. Lee San, thank you very much for your thank you, Lee. awesome question. Now, the next question is from David Cowan. Did I pronounce that correctly? And he says, what's the difference between modoru and modosu? Mm, good question. The verb modoru means to go back or to return. Yes. But in Japanese, you have a thing called jidoshi and tadoshi. Mm -hmm. So jidoshi is what's called an intransitive verb. And this is where you can make a sentence without any objects. So, it, you know, it's something like, I'll return, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll go back. I'll go back. But a transitive verb is you have to have an object at the end of the sentence. So mm -hmm. you're doing something to something. So right. it's like, I'll return the book. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking about something that really does something by itself, mm -hmm. it doesn't need an object. It just means like, watashi wa modoru, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You could say something like, kaisha ni modoru, kaisha ni modoru. I'm going to go back to the office. Kaisha ni modoru, mm -hmm. kaisha ni modoru. So I'm going to go back to the office. Now, that is a jidoshi, intransitive verb, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the other one is tadoshi, which is the transitive verb. That means you need to return something. So, for example, I don't know, Ami Sensei, what would you return? You could say, hon o modosu. But you would say that um, 本を modosu, returning a book. Yeah. But in this case, for modosu, it would usually be returning it to a shelf, a bookshelf, or like putting something back in its original place. There's also the verb kaisu. Yes. So a kaisu is kind of returning something to someone, right? And then modosu is like returning something to its original place. Yes. But but not to get too complicated. Basically. Uh, intransitive and transitive. Another um, one I learned first was tomeru, tomaru. Mm. Tomeru, tomaru. Tomeru, tomaru. Let's call the whole thing off. <laughs> da -da. Sorry, sorry. That was a that was a terrible dad joke. So tomeru means you stop something. So kuruma o tomeru. Mm -hmm. So you stop the car. But 
tomaru means something stops by itself, like the car stopped. Right. Kuruma ga tomatta or kuruma ga tomaru. Mm-hmm. So the car stopped maybe by itself for some reason. It's, it's a little tricky, but you do use it a lot. Um, the other one is like aku and akeru. Mm-hmm. You know, to open and be open. So you use that for shops and stuff. It's kind of intermediate Japanese and we shouldn't go down the rabbit hole here, but um, <laughs> but that's basically the difference. Okay. Ami sensei, Hi. Zanas asks, could you explain differences between aruku, kuru, and iku? Yes. Great question. Aruku is to walk somewhere. So... Kaisha made aruku. Kaisha made aruku. I'm going to walk to my mm. office or my work. I'm going to walk、right. walk to work. Okay, kuru means to come. So, you know, you can ask somebody, Party ni kuru? Party ni kuru? Are you coming to the party? Party ni kuru? And then iku means to go. So, パーティーに行く。パーティーに行くよ。I'm going to the party. I've got a question.、はい、is it the same in English where someone is coming from another place to where you are? Yes. And going is from your location to somewhere else. That's the same, right? Yes. So, kuru and iku, yes, is come and go. Iku and go are conceptually the same thing. Yes. You're, you're in one location, you are going to another place. And kuru means. Someone or something in another place is coming to your location. Is that what you're asking, Zanas? I hope so. I think that might be what, but I don't know. Let's hope so. <laughs> yeah, let's hope so. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Zanas. Okay. And the next question is for Mo, or is it Moe? I think it's Mo. Apologies to people if I murder your <laughs> names. I'm really sorry. I do apologize. Anyway, Mo says, I don't know if you guys have already covered this in a previous lesson. I'm not sure. I've only just discovered your podcast. Well, welcome. Thank you for listening.、Mm-hmm. Have you covered the types of questions you'd be asked in Japan? Like, what's your name? What's your hobby? And actually, we have. So, to answer your question, check out podcast number 10. It's entitled The Top 10 Questions You Will Be Asked in Japan. So, we, we cover that in detail. We won't go through it here, but check out podcast number 10.、Um, we ask you, where are you from? Why did you come to Japan? What do you do? So, go check that one out. That's podcast number 10. Thank you very much. For the、Thank、wonderful、you. question, Mo san. Now, the next question is from Jonathan, and he says, Hey, Alex, how do you handle misunderstandings when speaking to someone in Japanese? I'm an intermediate speaker and spent two years in full time language school. Cool, that's awesome.、Wow. One of the constant struggles was when you miss a piece of context and then continue down an incorrect path in the conversation. Yes, I've been there many <laughs> times. So it's not that you just misunderstood everything, but you misapplied it somehow. Okay. So、mm-hmm. someone talks about fork handles, and、What? you're thinking that he talked about four candles. You, you know, that, that、ah. kind of thing. Right, right, right. right. Okay. That's funny. So, but so what, what would you say to how would you rectify a misunderstanding、uh-huh. in、um, Japanese? Sensei. Um, I guess, you know, like,、uh, like Jonathan said, you know, he's, if he says, like, Wakarimasen deshita, you know, I don't understand、mm. or I didn't understand, then it's like really broad. So、yeah. instead of that, you could say,、uh, you could say, like, you could use the word kanchigai, which is literally misunderstanding. Right. And so you could say, Mm, 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 mm. I may have misunderstood you. And then you could follow up maybe with something like, One more time, please. Or, Hmm. What did you say at first again? You know, if you maybe just miss the first part. Yeah, that's a good one. Oh, I'm going to use that. Okay. <laughs> great. Yeah. So, great question, Jonathan. By the way, Jonathan, don't feel bad. Yeah, we've all been there. Jenny Lee asks Hi, Alex. Could you possibly walk people through how to make a dinner reservation over the phone? Thank you. 
Great one, yeah. I already recorded a podcast on making a dinner reservation that is currently not available at the moment. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. Um, as it was part of the old premium area, which I will be opening again. However, as you asked so nicely, <laughs> I'll send you a copy. <sighs> Just to you. It's because she's a girl. Everyone. Not a Alex all. <laughs> Absolutely not. Alex is nicer <laughs> to girls, I think. <laughs> Of course, I treat men like <laughs> equally horribly. Horribly, <laughs> uh. yeah. But uh, I no, I actually recorded a podcast about that, and um, it was kind of like a little extra free lesson that we did. So I will send that to you, Jenny Lee San. And actually, I will eventually put that up, but it's actually a little advanced. So be warned, Jenny Lee San. Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of hard. Okay, Lou asks, Hi Alex, I'm a long-time fan of the podcast and I actually used to learn some phrases and words when I went on my own last September. Oh, fantastic, yeah. you came to Japan. My question is this, if I'm traveling in Japan on my own, will strangers find it weird that a gaijin, a foreigner, is trying to communicate with them using very, you know, basic Japanese? Um, will they find it weird? It's an interesting question. What do you think, uh, Ami Sensei? Nope, not at all. Cool. <laughs> um, I'd say that because, you know, most Japanese people don't speak any English, you know, um, and so it makes sense that you're trying to communicate with them in Japanese, I think. Yeah. It'll make it easier for both parties, I think. Plus, when you try to speak English to Japanese people, I think a lot of the older generation We'll just shut you down right away. But if you approach them in Japanese, I think there'll mm. be a higher chance of them helping you out. So I don't think it's weird at all. No. And also, don't forget that Japanese people are generally very appreciative of people who make the effort to try and speak even basic Japanese, you know? So yeah, yeah. An idea I like to have is try to focus more on communication rather than having perfect vocabulary and perfect grammar. Right. If you can, it's better to stumble badly through a conversation than trying to come up with this perfectly polished sentence. And Japanese people are very, very accommodating and very, very appreciative of people who make the effort. And they're like, what? You care? You bothered <laughs> to come all the way over here and learn our language? So just seriously, you know, even just a well-timed arigato yeah. and onegaishimasu yeah. makes a huge difference. So no, it's not weird at all. And mm -hmm. um, I, I thoroughly endorse you learning Japanese. So keep, keep up the good work. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm going to do the next two questions together because they're both on the Japanese language proficiency test. And I got questions from Vegard. Hey, Vegard, how's it going? And also from David Frey. Hey, David, awesome to hear from you. And thank you very much for the question, sir. And Vegard says, I'm thinking of going for the JLPT four or five in December. Awesome. Better choose one. Which one are you going to do? <laughs> Don't have much time left. And Vegard says, do you have some recommendations for good prep books or mock tests? And David says, I just registered for the N5 level JLPT exam in Los Angeles on December 2nd. Awesome. Good job, sir. Really, really good. He continues, I'm using it as a tool to gauge progress and add purpose and drive to my study rhythm. And that's a really good idea. Yeah, I, uh, I absolutely endorse that. Any tips, any thoughts on the JLPT in general? Okay, so to answer your questions, a good book you might want to buy for, for JLPT study is Nihongo So Matome. They have an owl on the front, and I believe they include mock tests, if I'm not mistaken. And they're pretty popular amongst Japanese teachers, at least here in Japan. I've seen them a lot. They're in most good bookstores. So go check those out. That's Nihongo Somatome. If you're a complete beginner in Japanese, I would recommend getting a teacher if you've got the time and resources to do so. They'll be able to answer any questions you have and correct any mistakes immediately. They'll also be able to give you some conversational practice that you won't be able to get by studying the JLPT by yourself. Also, just a word about the skills you'll need to pass the JLPT. If you're new to this, number one, you have to be able to read some kanji. 
I believe you need to know about 100 or so for level five. So get yourselves a good Kanji learning app or an SRS, which is a spaced repetition system app like Anki, so you can test yourself. Um, there are loads of good Kanji apps um, online, so go go check those out. Um, number two, you're going to have to be able to read quickly because they've got reading comprehension questions too. So you do need to practice reading again and again just until you pick up some speed and you do improve. Again, you'll be able to do that if you get a good JLPT study book. Nihongo so Matome isn't a bad book to start with. Listening is another skill. Again, just practice using the CDs that accompany the textbooks that you buy and listen, listen, listen. You'll notice various repeating patterns and types of conversations that frequently appear in the JLPT materials. So just keep listening and keep doing that. And then finally, you need to learn some grammar. Again, the JLPT study books will teach you some good grammar points, all the grammar that you need to know. And you might also want to go online and check out websites such as nihongoichiban.com or jlptstudy.net. They've got some good lists of grammar, vocabulary and kanji and other stuff that you need to know for the test. And then kind of my final feelings about the JLPT. I think they really are a great way to gauge your progress, as, as you were saying, David. And you can really benefit from the fact that the syllabus, it's already been done for you. It doesn't have a speaking component, which is the main downside, but hopefully you'll get that practice somewhere else, maybe from your teacher or your family or your friends. And levels N5, N4 and N3, I think are pretty good exams that test a balanced set of Japanese communication skills. As for the N2 and the N1, that they're kind of different beasts. The N2 is definitely more academic as it has a lot more lower frequency vocabulary. You, you can learn some pretty out there kotowaza, like old phrases that you don't usually use every day in conversation. And if I'm not mistaken, the N1 was specifically designed for people who wanted to study at a Japanese university. It's common for translators and simultaneous interpreters to have the N1 as a necessary qualification to do their job. Just to kind of get back on this thread, make sure you study daily get as much reading and listening practice as you can. And you want to use things like mnemonics and creative visual association techniques for learning the kanji and vocabulary and all the, and all the other stuff you need to know. So good luck everyone taking the JLPT in December. Good luck, Vegard. Good luck, David. I hope you do really well. And I hope that answered your question. Okay, the next question is from Lutzu. And Lutzu writes, what is the best way you've found to make kanji readings stick? I've just been learning them from learning new vocab, but I'm having trouble getting them to stick, especially in cases where the reading changes slightly due to being a different word from what I originally learned. Okay, well, let me give you my top nine tips to make the kanji stick in your brain. And these are the tips that worked personally for me. Some of them may work for you, some others might not. This is how I studied kanji back in the days before YouTube and iPhone apps and all the amazing content that's out there today. Anyway, so, okay, number one, use a flashcard app like Anki to test yourself. Anki and other good kanji apps used what's called the space repetition system, which I talked about a bit earlier, to teach you. So that means the more times you correctly remember the kanji, the longer the interval between the times it tests you. And the kanji that you have trouble remembering will be shown to you more often. Makes sense, right? So it's a super efficient and effective system. I like using it. Um, okay, number two, only learn kanji that are relevant or high frequency or of interest to you. So choose a specific set of kanji to learn so you don't waste time learning other kanji that you'll never use. Kind of obvious, but it's, it's worth saying. So for example, I was just talking about David and Vegard. Um, their specific goal at the moment is to learn all the JLPT level five kanji. It, it's a super achievable goal and you can really focus on that. And you're not going to waste time learning all these other kanji that you probably will never need again in the future. Okay, number three, use visual associative memory techniques. That means look at the shape of the kanji and think about what it reminds you of and use that image to help you remember. 
So, for example, um, think about the kanji for mouth, and that's kuchi. Kuchi. It basically looks like a four sided square or a mouth, right? So it's pretty easy to remember. And another one,、uh, the kanji for leg is ashi. And it kind of looks like a skeleton leg from the side, at least to me. And again, that makes it really easy for me to remember. So, you know, just look at the kanji. What does it remind What do those basic shapes remind you of? So, number four, use mnemonic memory techniques. So, this is where you use sounds and rhymes and words to remember more complicated information. So, we were just talking about the kanji kuchi, which means mouth, right? Now, kuchi, we, let's think of the sound.、Um, could mean something like kuchi kuchi ku, you know, the sound you make to a, a, a baby to make it smile. What does it smile with? It smiles with its mouth. Does that make sense? Kind of made sense to me. But again, use your own kind of sounds. What do, this, what do those sounds sound like? Okay. So, for example,、uh, another one is like when you're learning the kanji one, two, and three, ichi ni san. Writing them is really easy, right? So, ichi is just a single horizontal stroke. Ni is two horizontal strokes, and san is three horizontal strokes. Super easy. But the sound, ichi ni san, can make up a silly sentence like ichi ni san. You imagine a guy whose knee is Ichi and San is like, you know, Tanaka San, so Ichi Ni San. So it's Mr. Ichi Ni. So I don't know. That, that, that's kind of a, a stupid mnemonic I use to first learn those kanji and those words. Number five, and this is really important learn kanji in context. So make sure to learn example sentences that will help you learn not only what the kanji means, but also how to use it naturally in a sentence. Super, super important. So, for example, if you looked up in a dictionary the word for today, you'd actually get two answers. One is honjitsu, and the other one is kyo. And honjitsu is made from two kanji, hon, which means either book or base, and jitsu, which means day. And the other one, kyo, is Ima and Nichi, now day. So both of them mean day, but they're used differently. And an example sentence will teach you how. And if you want to know the, the difference, Honjitsu is basically a more formal way of saying kyo. But、um, again, learn everything in example sentences. Number six, learn stroke order. Each kanji is written with a specific number of strokes in a specific order and direction. Writing them out by hand with the correct stroke order will give you a deeper understanding of the kanji and how to write them properly. Now, some people argue that in the age of touchscreen technology, writing kanji is completely pointless. And yeah, I, I understand that argument. However, I think if you can write them out by hand, Your brain and your muscles remember them at a deeper level. And I, I, I hear some research says that when you take notes, writing them down physically, it actually leads to better memory retention. So I do it that way. I mean, <laughs> remember, I learned kanji 11 billion years ago. I wrote them all out by hand before you know, the days of iPhones and things. So,、um, But even today, I, I would highly re- recommend writing them out, just getting used to the stroke order, and you do get a much deeper appreciation for them. Because remember, Japanese isn't a language, people, it's an art. <laughs> anyway, number seven, learn the radicals. So, just to put this like really, really simply, basic kanji shapes. Can be combined with other kanji shapes to make new kanji. So, for example, if you take the kanji kuchi, which we just studied a moment ago, and you place it underneath the kanji ju, which is the kanji for the number 10, you actually get a new kanji and it's called furui. And furui means old. So, now with your super duper memory techniques that I just talked about a moment ago, you know that 10 and mouth means old. So, perhaps you could make up a weird story, something like if you had 10 mouths to feed, you'd feel old. Yeah, I know. Okay, it sounds a bit weird, but anything that is striking or memorable or weird that you can use in your brain to make you remember it for a longer time, do it. And so, again, you know, using those mnemonics and visual associative techniques is really, really useful. Okay. Number eight, it might help if you learn groups of kanji together, such as body parts or the names of planets or kanji to write a basic email. 
So grouping information together in your brain can make it easier to remember. So if you have a notebook, you might want to write, you know, um, all the kanji for car related kanji or all the characters for health related kanji, a anything, you know, grouping them together is quite a good way to not only be able to write and read them, but also talk about them later. And number nine, Invest in the book Remembering the Kanji by James Hasig. That's Remembering the Kanji. It's a bit of a classic kanji learner's book. It's worth having in your library. And what it does is it teaches you each kanji with interesting, memorable stories that help you to visually remember them more effectively. It, it's a it's a bit of a classic. I'd, I'd go buy it. But um, that that's a really good book. Now, again, some of these techniques may work for you. They may not. But... Um, Try them out. Send me an email. Tell me if it works for you. And Rutsu uh, san, gambatte with your kanji. I hope I hope that worked. Did that work? I hope it does. Good luck. And uh, funnily enough, that this is really really funny. The moment after I got the question from Rutsu, Edward wrote, "I don't have a clear question, but I would like to know more about how to learn kanji and generally kanji related studying." There you go. I just answered your question. I. I I hope that was helpful. I ain't repeating myself, people. So straight on to the next question, which is from Kikoi. And Kikoi says, I have a question. Well, good for you, sir. What should the sequence be for studying Japanese? For example, number one, study hiragana and katakana. Number two, study basic expressions. Number three, study kanji. And number four, study vocabulary. Yep. Kikoi, that sounds like a good order to me. Uh, there's no reason why you can't learn kanji from the beginning. However, a lot of kanji books do require a knowledge of hiragana for the readings. So yeah, hiragana is probably one you should definitely start with. Although I have a question for you. What about Japanese conversation? Do, is that another goal of yours? So, you know, do you have friends or a teacher that you can practice with? If not, I recommend you might want to think about that. When you're learning a new language, I think you need to hit it from as many different angles as possible. So, for example, when you study kanji, can you write it? Can you say it? Can you understand it in conversation? Could you use it naturally in conversation? Could you write a natural example sentence? Um, so those are some random ideas for you. But uh, Kikoi, good luck with your Japanese. I hope that's useful for you. Okay, the next question is from Nicholas. Konnichiwa, Nicholas. He says, could you give me some tips for a good weekly study plan that includes reading, listening, shadowing, vocabulary, and new kanji or kanji reviews? Super awesome question. That's a really good question. I think that's uh, maybe something most people listening to this podcast would like to know. So, it's a good question. A really easy answer would be go buy yourself a book like Genki. And, you know, that's going to teach you all the grammar and vocabulary you need to know. And then go out and buy a Japanese conversation book, something like Nihongo Fun and Easy, published by Ask, which is ASK. And those two books will give you the classroom grammar approach and the conversational approach to studying Japanese. You don't have to get those books. There are other ones like, you know, Japanese for Busy People. And I think Nihongo no Kiso is another good one. And if you go on Amazon, there's a good selection of conversational Japanese textbooks to choose from. Consider studying for the JLPT. It's not a perfect system, but it will definitely give you plenty of material to work with. And again, um, I want to ask you a question. Um, what is your specific Japanese study goal? Do you want to be able to read manga? Do you want to understand anime? Do you want to know enough conversational Japanese to come here on holiday? Or perhaps you want to become a ninja or the prime minister of Japan? I don't know. D depending on what your goal is, your study regime will be affected by that, right? Makes sense, right? And so let me take this opportunity to mention that I'm actually going to be coming up with a travel Japanese course very soon. And that will definitely give you the vocabulary, the audio, the kanji, the grammar, the phrases and everything you need to travel to Japan and have an awesome holiday here. So it's also good for people who might want to move here more permanently. So uh, that might help you too. So I'll let you know when that goes up very, very soon. Stay tuned, people. Anyway, Nicholas, I hope that helps. 
Next question is from Faye, and she says, How do I get fluent speaking Japanese and forming sentences? Mmm, good question. Okay, so Faye san, imagine Japanese as Lego blocks. You know what Lego is, right? And as you learn a language, you start learning individual words like sushi and taberu and restaurant, right? And imagine those single words like single Lego blocks, right? And then you learn a bunch of new words and slowly you start to snap them together, right? So, for example, you start with sushi and maybe taberu or tabeo. So you can then snap those together into sushi o tabeo, let's eat sushi. And you can drill those in short patterns, something like this. So, sushi o tabeo, ramen o tabeo. Sashimi o tabeo. So, you know, let's eat sushi, let's eat ramen, let's eat sashimi. And then slowly you can add other words like ashita sushi o tabeo. So, tomorrow let's go eat sushi. And if you keep at it and don't give up, you, you slowly add more and more words, and these structures start to kind of build themselves in your brain, so to speak, right? And slowly but surely, your fluency will improve. I highly recommend drilling sentences out loud, but more importantly, you just need to get as much speaking practice as you can. If you're not at least shadowing Japanese audio or practicing conversation every day, then your progress will be slower. But good luck, you can do it. Just keep at it and you will improve. I know when you start out, it's a bit frustrating. Because you don't feel like you're really talking, but you know, just keep at it and you will be surprised very, very slowly, but surely your fluency will improve. So, Feisan, Nihongo, Gambatte Kudasai. Okay, next question is from Robert and he says, Hi there, Alex. He says, One of my biggest problems when I study Japanese is I can't really find vocabulary on my own. When I look up a word in a dictionary, I always get multiple results and I never know which one to use. So, what method would you recommend to find new vocabulary? And、uh, thanks a lot for asking and good luck with the new podcast. I'll be listening from Spain. Well, muchas gracias, señor. Okay, so that's kind of a hard question. I, I understand your pain. And dictionaries can sometimes be more of a nuisance than they are help. So, you know, you look up a word and there's like 10 different ways to say it and you don't know which is the correct way. So, let's kind of back up a bit here and kind of think of a more general strategy that might help you. So, before I study single words, what I like to do is define something that I want to do, like a goal I want to achieve. So, for example, I might want to go shopping. Or get a taxi to Shibuya, or, or fight ninjas, or buy some shoes, or whatever, right? So don't focus too much on individual vocabulary if possible. It's more about the phrases that help you to do something. Now, it's not always possible to do that, but if you can, try to learn vocabulary in context, like I talked about before, right? And for example, if you want to take a taxi to Shibuya, When you get into the taxi, you say, Shibuya made onegai shimasu. Shibuya made onegai shimasu. So, Shibuya to please. So, so, literally, Shibuya to please, to Shibuya, please, right? So, you could use the word kudasai, right? So, Shibuya, Shibuya made kudasai. Shibuya made kudasai, which is not completely wrong. And if you looked it up in a dictionary, you, you wouldn't know which word to use. However, if you took a taxi and you're with your Japanese friend, you're gonna hear your Japanese friend say, Shibuya made onegai shimasu. So you're gonna learn it from、um, experience and you're just gonna learn it from seeing those full sentences, not individual words. Again, it's not always possible to do it this way, but again, try to learn from phrases, sentences, and dialogues, because that's how we teach it on Learn Japanese Pod. That's why we have these. Dialogues, you know, like, you know, talking to your friend or fighting ninjas or whatever. Why do I keep talking about fighting ninjas all the time? <laughs> anyway, Robert, I hope that was useful to you. So basically, focus on the sentences and the dialogues before you focus on the individual vocabulary, if possible. So the next question is from John Pepper, and he basically asks, 
um, about the use of ikenai as in you must do something. So he says, tabenakya means I must eat, but tabenakya ikenai also means I must eat. Go listen to podcast 18. We do cover that topic. Um, thanks for the question. Sorry, I won't answer that right now, but uh, trust me, podcast 18 will really help you. Okay, next question is from Ricardo Martinez. What? The Ricky Martin? Anyway, um, <laughs> Ricardo writes, I'm a 27-year-old guy from Mexico. Well, welcome to the podcast, sir. I'm a native Spanish speaker, and I know some English and like to use it to study Japanese. Yeah, isn't that cool? Um, I really like it when non-native English speakers learn from this podcast because they can learn my crazy English, and also Amy's beautiful NHK Japanese. So that, that's really cool when you're learning two languages at the same time. He said, I came across your podcast by looking for several interesting ones, and I stuck with yours because of the originality of the program. Well, thank you very much, sir. And his main question is, is he wants to know, is there a way to make reading and translating an enjoyable activity? Whoa, <laughs> that, that's, now you're asking. <laughs> Okay, so Ricardo, as, as speakers of European languages, it's relatively easy for us to learn other European languages as we can read them, right? We, we share the same alphabet. The kanji and the kana writing systems are big barriers to us to learning Japanese, right? Now, all I can say is start as simply as you can. Try to read what interests you and read what is easy. You might want to start with children's manga or storybooks. Maybe not your cup of tea. Maybe it's not the most interesting thing for you, but you do have to start somewhere. You might want to research if you can find some graded Japanese readers, which are books that give you texts with differing levels of difficulty. Also, I would recommend a really, really, really good resource is News Web Easy. News Web Easy, and that's by NHK. Just go online and, and look for News Web Easy. It's a fantastic resource for reading basic Japanese, and it gives you up-to-date news stories about Japan. And it has audio and furigana, which are the small hiragana characters that show you the reading of the kanji. Now, it's for me, I think it's one of the best basic reading resources out there. So it's not only you, Martinez. Um, everyone, you must read News Web Easy. It's a really, really awesome thing. Another thing you might want to do is get the Chrome browser extension Likai-kun or Likai-chan. And they help you to read kanji on any web page. So when you install it, you can hover your mouse over the kanji and it will give you a pop-up showing the hiragana reading and a dictionary definition. It's super, super useful. So yeah, check those resources out. Anyway, I hope that answered your question and nihongo gambatte kudasai. Okay, question is from Sam and Sam asks, I think the thing I've been wondering the most recently is, isn't it better to focus on the grammar of the language instead of vocabulary? I feel that knowing a language's structure would allow me to input vocabulary instead of the other way around. Okay, you're coming at me with some pretty deep, difficult questions, people, but I shall endeavor to answer this. I shall try to answer it at least. Anyway, okay, so oh, where to start? Well, let's back up a little bit and start from basics. Now, I don't want to sound too much like a broken record, but what is your specific Japanese communication goal, Sam? Nandeska, What do you want to do? Be really specific. Is it speaking? Is it reading? Is it a bit of everything? What interests you about Japanese? Is it the culture? Is it the language? Do you want to get a job in Japan? Having a clear goal will definitely inform your study regime. So think about that first. In other words, what's your why? You know, why do you want to study Japanese? Okay. So the other thing I'd like to draw your attention to, if you don't already know about this, are two theories of how we humans acquire a second language. So, you know, in how do people learn languages? So one idea takes a more traditional approach, and that is you consciously learn vocabulary and grammar rules using rote memory. 
So you do stuff like, you know, making lists of words and phrases and grammar, and you drill them over and over again until you can say them without thinking. And it's, it's a very conscious effort that you're doing. Another approach is called CI, which is comprehensible input. And the idea is that you actually learn a language through lots and lots of input from real sources, such as reading books, watching movies, hanging out with your friends and having fun conversations, listening to music and so on and so on, right? And this is all done at a subconscious level. You're not actively trying to learn the language, but through repeated exposure to the same, you know, words and experiences, it all eventually sticks. Now, the comprehensible part of comprehensible input means that what linguists call the signal or the message, in other words, the language that you're listening to, is in part already comprehensible to you. So you you can kind of understand it already. Now, let's take an example. Let's say you're watching a Japanese weather forecast and you can't speak a word of Japanese, okay? And the announcer is pointing to this cool graphic on the map of Japan and the announcer says, Ame, and you've got no idea what that word is, except they show you a video of rain and then they use their pointy sticky thing to point to a kanji of rain and then uh, you see a cloud with drops coming down and you can work out that ame means rain and you don't need a dictionary and you don't need a teacher to tell you what it means, right? So according to this theory, focusing on grammar or vocabulary isn't really the point, okay? So what approach should you use? Well, I mean, obviously you can use lots of different approaches. So for example, studying grammar, I think, will massively help you when you're a beginner. And it helps you when you're a beginner because it gives you an easy framework that you can use to construct easy phrases and easy sentences, right? However, when you get to an intermediate level of speaking or, and go beyond, you'll find that grammar becomes less and less helpful to you because like we, we use slang and grammatically incorrect, sen you know, quote unquote, grammatically incorrect sentences. So you'll find that the more advanced that you get in Japanese, the less your grammar books and your textbooks will actually be able to help you. So what you need to do then is you need to get out more and practice conversation as much as you can. Do think about the comprehensible input method, which is basically just experiencing Japanese. So that means, you know, attending a Japanese class, trying to practice conversation with your Japanese friends, you know, watching movies, you know, taking an interest in the culture, I think. Um, so, yeah, um, sorry, this was a bit of a long winded answer to your question. But yeah, um, sure, learn grammar. But remember, grammar will only take you so far. But remember, eventually, you're going to have to get out there, practice conversation, make mistakes, sound silly, say stupid things, get embarrassed. But eventually, you will, you know, really improve and you will improve your fluency. So thank you very much for your question, Sam. Now, Bernard asks, Hope all is well and you're not affected by the typhoon. Thank you very much. Can you give some of the most common uses of mama? The mysterious word referring to the state of things staying unchanged. Oh yeah, like sono mama. Um, also, I can't find anywhere the appropriate phrases that Siri on the iPhone responds to in Japanese, right? So <laughs> you're having difficulty talking to Siri in Japanese on your iPhone. By the way, that's a really cool way to practice your Japanese. Sure. Like, can you can you get Siri to understand what the hell you're saying, mm -hmm. right? By the way, I hope you don't mind me mentioning in your intro in the email below. So I wrote an email to him. He says, the N is mi missing in konnichiwa. <laughs> so I didn't say konnichiwa, I say konnichi which yeah. is a Japanese sur surname mm -hmm. rather than the greeting konnichiwa. Mm -hmm. I suspect you know this and it was just bait to get responses. <laughs> no, Bernard, um, I'm an idiot. I, it was a typo. It's a typo, <laughs> I okay. I wasn't trying, <laughs> seriously, I wasn't trying to get responses. We got totally overwhelmed with responses. So uh, that's just because all of you are awesome. No, I, I am, as you know, I'm a complete idiot. I just... <laughs> 
incorrectly no. spelled it. By the way, just just a side note: when you say konnichiwa, so we gaijin tend to say konnichiwa, yeah. but it's actually konnichiwa. So konnichiwa, yeah. mm-hmm. not konnichiwa. Right. right. So cool. Mm-hmm. So, uh, two things: sonomama and what would you say to Siri, Ami Sensei? Oh, um, yeah, a lot of things you could say to Siri in Japanese. So it's pretty much like English, right? So, mm-hmm. for example, kyo no tenki wa. Kyo no tenki wa. What's today's weather like? Or so and so ni denwa shite. Call so and so. Right. Atarashi iru suden wa aru. Atarashi iru suden wa aru. Are there any new voice messages? Shashin o hiraku. Shashin o hiraku. Open photos. So and so ni message o okuru. Message so and so. Chinchaku message o yomi agete. Chinchaku message o yomi agete. Open the new message received. And something like. Shiji ni gohan no yakusoku. Shiji ni gohan no yakusoku. Schedule dinner at seven. We should totally do a city iPhone Japanese lesson. Yeah. We should. Let's do that. Yeah. What does Android have? Google, they'll be like, okay, Google. <laughs> right. Let's let let's do it. Let's do a lesson on that because I think you know. Yeah. Then you can practice. <laughs> By the way, uh, Bernard, fantastic question. Really, really good stuff. Thank you. So next question is uh, from Keram, and Keram asks, "Yo, Alex. <laughs> Yo, Keram. Are J rock music lyrics a good way to choose which kanji to memorize? Hmm, interesting. Or should I go the sho ichini sanji?" Goroku, chu, ichini san, nan root. Maybe a hybrid would work out well. Please don't judge my genre of choice. I can't stand pop. How dare you, sir? We don't, we won't judge you. <laughs> How dare you besmirch the name of J pop? Um, so basically, what he's asking is he wants to learn kanji. So, should he just read lyrics from music to learn kanji, or should he use a more a traditional style of learning the kanji as Japanese school kids learn kanji.、Mm-hmm. Um, so, what would you say, Ami Sensei? Okay, this is just my personal opinion,、yeah. but I would say even if you just learn shogaku <laughs> elementary、yeah. school kanji, you can totally get by. And、um, regarding lyrics, I think lyrics are awesome too, but sometimes they throw in some curveballs called ateji. Which are basically made up ways to read kanji, sometimes slang. So I would say get a solid foundation down with the, you know, even just the shogaku elementary kanji, and you should be good. <laughs> you know, we got, a, we got a hell of a lot of emails on kanji, which I will be answering soon. Yeah, let's do it. Out of all the emails we got, the most asked. Questions were all about kanji.、Yeah. So I think, Ami Sensei,、mm-hmm. we need to do a kanji course. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have like whiteboards and stuff, right? <laughs> exactly.、Yeah. Oh, we're going to go super high society with our whiteboards. We're going to do it. <laughs> so this one is sorry, didn't get the name. It was not named, but this lovely person asks Hi, Alex. Only recently discovered the show. Well, thank you very much. And loving it. Well, thank you very, very much. Gradually working my way through the back catalogue. Thank you, Triple Much. Have spent the last six winters working in Hokkaido. Very cool. And I'm trying to supplement my skills by learning kanji. Another kanji question,、mm-hmm. you see. Any thoughts or tips on deciding when to use jin versus nin? That's the kanji for person. It's got two pronunciations、mm-hmm. jin and nin. It constantly trips me up. I seem to. Have a handle on hito, but he can't work out when you pronounce it jin and when you pronounce it nin. What do you think?、Uh, Ami so、sensei? I think hito, you know, whenever、uh, you use hito, it's usually、um, preceded by no or na, right? So、yeah. something na hito, or, you know, he says he has a handle on hito. So we won't dive into that too much, but,、um, you know, jing. And I'm, I, you know, you may already know this, but、uh, Jing is used often with nationalities. So, like Nihon Jing, Japanese, America Jing, American, Igirisu Jing,、uh, English, 
Mm. Um, mm. You know, and then ning for counting, right? So like yeah. nan ning, how many people? San ning, yo ning, go ning, roku ning, so on and so forth, right? Um, ning is also used um, um, like after a noun a lot of times. For example, kuro ning. So kuro is like a um, lot of work or a um, lot of, I'd say, troubles. So kuro ning is somebody that's gone through a lot and, you know, gone through a lot of troubles. Han ning. So han ning means uh, culprit. And uh, so han is like a... Um, crime. A crime, exactly. Han yeah. ning. Yeah, right. Um, so, like, it also means criminal, right? Criminal, yes, that's it, that's it. That's the word I was thinking of. Um, but, you know, again, there are always exceptions, uh, mm. like in any language. And, for example, tabibito, okay, tabibito is written, uh, in kanji, it's written trip person. Um, so, we don't say tabinin, we say tabibito. So someone that travels, hima jing, is also in kanji, uh, written hima jing. Uh, hima is like spare time. So hima jing is somebody that has a lot of spare time, basically. So, you know, we do just kind of have to memorize these exceptions. But otherwise, I think um, it does follow the rules I mentioned. Yeah. Gambate. So, Ami Sensei, Iro Iro, Oshete, Itadaite, Arikato Gozaimas. Yeah, do itashimaste. What did you think of the questions today, Ami Sensei? <sighs> they were all awesome. Yeah. Keep them coming. <laughs> Keep them coming. Yeah, again, just uh, hit us up at info at learnjapanesepod.com. Go online at japanesepod.com slash questions. Send us your questions. We'll try and answer as many as we can. Yeah. Happy we got inundated with questions. Sad. <laughs> We got inundated with questions because they're just too many. But do keep them coming. Do keep them coming. It's, it's really great. Yes. Thank you guys so much once again. I think we need to do a course on kanji. Mm -hmm. We need to definitely do a kanji. It's obvious that there's a lot of people who are really, I can't handle kanji. What do yeah. I do? So I think we should do like a guide to learning kanji. And also... Intonation intonation really want to do yep. one in intonation and also i'd love to do a podcast on how to talk to your robot phone in japanese so like talking yes. to talking to city yes. talking to google um yes. what kind of questions can you ask especially if you're visiting here as you know a tourist in japan if you've got a wi-fi yeah you can actually ask syrian i mean of course you could use english but you're here to learn <laughs> japanese so yeah that's a really good thing and again you know if you've got an iphone or an android phone switch it to japanese see if you can get siri to understand you great so ami sensei again thanks so much of course absolutely and everyone thanks so much for listening to the podcast next lesson is all about the word yappari. That's the next podcast that's coming out. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast. Keep practicing Japanese every day. Nihongo ishokeme. Gambatte kudasai. Gambatte kudasai. Matta ne. Matta ne.